I'm going to go around and make sure I have everybody's name. I know I'm just going to be with you for one session this morning, but it's going to make me feel better if I can call on your name rather than person in the white coat, person who's sitting close to the window. <laughs> Tiffany, Margaret, Julie, Erica, Lynette, Keith, Mary Beth, right here is April. Tanya, Jackie is next to you. Tracy, right? Is it Shars? That's mm -hmm. Rachel, Rhonda, Diva, Robert, and Jared. Okay. My name is Jonathan. I'm a professor in the English department. Uh, up until this session, I just got finished teaching, teaching, leading. I've never done something like this before. So, what I thought is in a week where you are going to be deluged, almost like in front of a fire hose, deluged with information. What I hope is that over the next hour, I can give you some complimentary tools right, to do this project that you've got in front of you. Now, when, when I was given the prompt, writing with purpose, I thought, well, if, if I wanted to, I could talk to you for 45 minutes about in the weeds tools to help you write. There is nothing cooler than voice to text. The fact that you can turn on your phone and press the microphone button, talk into your phone, have it transcribe 95% correctly, forward that over to yourself and start not with a blank page with the cursor of death blinking at you, but with, <laughs> like, you may go through writer's block, you'll probably not have Cocker's block. So to be able to generate material that way, amazing. So voice to text, or my personal favorite, text to voice. There are free programs on the interweb, including programs you can pay for, that will take text and read it back to you which for your own writing is amazing. There's probably no better way of going back over your own writing than reading it out loud. And now you don't have to read it out loud. The computer can read it back out loud to you. And this is particularly cool for reading other people's material. So if you find yourself having difficulty concentrating when you read someone else's article, popping it in and listening to it as you read it, what an amazing tool. <laughs> or, here's just a small one, one that I give to my freshman students. You've got 15 pages worth of material. Paragraph by paragraph, you put it in a new document, and you unspool that code, uh, paragraph, and you put it as a numbered list, a sentence per list. Now, you know what that's going to do? It's going to force you to think about the continuity or flow of that particular paragraph. Does sentence three simply repeat sentence number one? Should there actually be a sentence 1.5? Can you see now that you've skipped the step? So all of those are in the weeds tools that I think can help you with writing, but that's not what I've been asked to help you with. I've been asked to help you think about your bird's eye view purpose so why are you doing this crazy thing that you're doing in the first place? And then to on the ground when you sit down to do your work on a Tuesday in October, what's the thing that's going to keep you going? Because when you're up against it in October on a Tuesday, you're not going to think, well, at least I have my phone to talk to. You're not going to think of a tool. It's going to be a purpose that you relate using that tool back to. So what you're going to see me do today is a little dance, not an actual dance, but a dialogue between the actual exercises we work through together and my stepping back and saying, here's how you can use this to help orient yourself when you're in the midst of dissertation writing work. So here's one I start every class with, gratitudes. So what I'd like you to start by doing this morning is closing your eyes, putting your hands over your heart, 
on taking a deep breath where you can feel the beat of your heart underneath your hands. And as you feel your heart beat, be reminded of all the gifts you've been given, including your heart, that you did not have to earn. That you did not have to do a certain amount of work in order to get a heart. That you were given it as a gift. And now, as you feel your heart underneath your hands, give God thanks for this gift and any other gift you've been given that you did not have. And now turn your thoughts to someone you are thankful for, someone who brings you joy, who when you are with them, you feel love and you feel love. Call the mind an image of that person's face, hear that person's voice, feel that person's presence, and give God thanks for that person. And now turn your thoughts to something you love getting to do. Something that when you do it, you feel alive, you feel free, you feel excited, you feel energized, or you feel peaceful, relaxed, calm. Bring up a particular mem uh, memory of you getting to do that thing, play it like a movie in your head where what you saw and heard and felt at that moment is what you hear and see and feel now. And then give God thanks for the opportunity and privilege to get to do that. And now turn your thoughts to God, the giver of every good and perfect gift, the one who gave you your heart, your relationships, the experiences that make life worth living, the one who knows you and loves you. And give him thanks. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for each of these students for the chance to learn alongside them today. Thank you for the hard work they put in to get here for the serious project they have signed up to perform, as well as all the skills and talent you've given them to be able to complete it. I pray that today you would give them encouragement, that you would give them joy, that they would lead today's sessions feeling more confident in their ability to do their work. And that more than that, they would grow in their ability to love you and love others through that work. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. Now, why start there? Because even today, it's 10.31. Probably already feels like you've been running a couple hours. From chapel over to another session. Over to this one, you've got just long enough to go to the bathroom. And now you're getting ready to start another session. To sit down and put yourself in a place of gratitude. To think, oh, the person teaching right next to me is my wife. I get to work at the same place as my wife. Two, to think about the fact that my three-year-old daughter, for whatever reason, is in this snuggling phase where she wakes up and she wants me to hold her and scratch her back while we listen to songs from the Lion King. Or to think about the fact that in 2017, when my wife took a job here, there wasn't a position for me here. I was still in Charleston. We were separate for a year. That God made a way for me to be able to be a full-time faculty member here alongside my wife. To start there, not with all of the difficulties that led up to 10.30 in the morning, 
not to think about all the things that are going to come after 1130 in the morning when the session's over, to start with two minutes of gratitude. There's probably no better way to clear the decks when you sit down to do your work. What we just did was not just for today. It is a way to start any session of research and writing. All right? The next thing I would say is that I want you to stand with me and we are going to do a couple recitations together. So if you would stand up and take the sheet that I got in front of you. Is there anyone who does not have a copy of this sheet? No, I can give it to you. Is there anyone who needs it? So, here's my little wrap about this. It's really easy for me as a literature and writing teacher to think, oh, writing, reading, it's just stuff that goes on up here and pretend like my students don't have bodies. And so if you were to set up a camera where that speaker is and turn on the mute button where you couldn't hear anything that was being said, just look at what people do in the course of my classes, if I'm not conscious, conscious about it, it would look at them sitting in the same position for 50 or 75 minutes. Maybe a little bit of shuffling, but not much. The reason I'm having you stand right now is to remind you that your body matters as much as your mind and that it will take both of those things working in tandem for you to do the work that you've got set in front of you for several summers. This is the first summer in eight years I have not graded AP exams. What they do when you grade AP exams is you and 2,500 other people pile into a concrete floor windowless conference center in Kansas City, Missouri, or Louisville, Kentucky, and you sit there and you grade 400,000 AP literature exams in seven days. And guess what? If you've been eating their food, for six days when you hit 2 p.m. on Thursday afternoon and you've got however many students' essays sitting in front of you, you are not going to get that essay, the fair and accurate reading it deserves. Because your body is suffering. It's not, it's not a question of understanding what they've written so much as feeling the way you feel because your body has sort of been pummeled over the course of the week. This writing process involves your body as much as your mind. Remember that. All right, we're going to do two things here. We're talking about writing with purpose. I want to give us a bird's eye view. This first question is from the Westminster Shorter Catechism. Let's read this together. What is the chief end of man? Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Now, what I love about this is everything we do is to glorify God. Okay, great. But enjoy, enjoy him forever. The thing you're doing, there should, I mean, maybe it's just when it's over, you'll feel joy. <laughs> but what I pray for you is that in the process of writing this thing, you not only feel that the work you're doing glorifies God, but you feel God's joy in doing that work well. And then specifically, let's think about language. So this is a quotation from a book called Modern Rhetoric by Cleon Brooks and Robert Penn Warren. Language is, first, a means of communication, and second, a means of thinking. We are once again talking about language as one way of learning how to live. Have a seat. If you approach the project you've got in front of you as a flaming hoop of fire to jump through, or a very tall hurdle to get over, you are missing the way in which, in the midst of this significant task, you can glorify God, enjoy Him forever. And more than that, you can learn how to live. Not many people can say they will have tackled a project as significant, as broad, as wide as the project you have set for yourself and then executed it. And one of the, I mean, so there have been times in my own life where I've been overweight. I was thinking specifically uh, about 
July of 2016. It would have been July of 2016. Right? I was 220 pounds. I was overweight. I wanted to lose some weight. Over the course of three months, I lost weight. Now, everything I do is not as quantifiable as getting to step on a scale and look at what the number is. But one of the cool things is I know now when I face an obstacle that seems for me, if I told myself, hey, you're going to lose 35 pounds over the course of a week or a month, that may seem like too much. Now, when I look at a goal like that, I can go back to that moment and what the sort of self-discipline, all the stuff I did to help make that happen. And I can tell myself I can do it. When you finish this dissertation process, it will be a kind of altar, a memorial you will be able to go back to for the rest of your life where you're like, I know what a difficult project looks like and I've done it. There will be a broader application for what you're learning how to do than simply the discipline or job you go into. There is a very real sense here that you will be learning how to live by putting this thing down and right. All right, let's start here then. If you have done your gratitude and you have uh, sat down to work, one of the things I'd like to do is give myself a prompt, a place to start. Now I've heard that you not only have your own dissertation project, for your time here you have a mock dissertation topic, is that right? Okay. Here's what I want you to do. Complete this prompt. I am studying, fill in the blank, you can fill that in with either one of the four topics you have for your mock topic or your actual topic if you feel so inclined. Because I want to find out, I'm interested in knowing what you want to discover as you do the, go through this process and then in order to help my reader better understand. That is, you're considering the fact that somebody else will have to read this thing and asking yourself what you want them to get out of it. I'm gonna give you three minutes to do that. And here's why I'm asking you to do that. How well can you articulate your project? This is a really simple prompt that gets at your ability to do that. Three minutes here. <clears throat> Can write down your answers in the space provided on your sheet or on your own piece of paper we're going to share with one another when we're through here. Three minutes, go to it. I am studying because I want to find out in order to help my reader better understand. Ninety more seconds. more seconds.
All right. Two things here. One, this prompt is not just for an entire dissertation project. You could use it as the first thing you do when you sit down to work today. I am reading, I am writing, and set yourself a goal for what you want to get out of the next 30 minutes, hour, 90 minutes. I mean, given world enough in time, you would have a full day to do what you're being asked to do. By sitting down and completing this prompt, you're giving yourself a goal to aim towards, and you're taking the pressure off simply diving in and trying to find your way. Here's the thing I want to accomplish because I want to find it out, and more than that, I want to help the person I'll be sharing with on the other side of this to understand something. Now, here's what I want you to do. I'm going to give you five minutes here to share what you've written with someone else. For those of you who are sharing a mock dissertation topic, you might actually be able to share the same topic and your approach to it. If you're sharing your actual dissertation topic, good, because approximately one million times over however long you do this process, somebody will ask you what is your project about. So it would be good if you were able to get it over in 30 seconds, right? Rather than having to pee, somebody look at your watch like, 25 hours later. <laughs> now, Jolene, if you could share with Tammy, uh, Margaret is with Tiffany, Mary Beth, if you could share with April, I think everybody else is next to someone, Robert is next to Jiva. Here's the thing I want you to pay attention to. Theoretically, the person you are sharing with is your reader. So, after you share how you completed the prompt, I would like you, the person who listened, to ask at least one question. At least one question. Sitting beside you is the kind of person who's doing the work you are doing. If they don't understand it, or if they want clarification, that's a really good thing. You can have an actual conversation with them about it, all right? Five minutes, share what you've written, ask at least one question, go to it.
One more minute. <laughs> Okay, let's draw our attention back to the front here. I hope I hope that was helpful. So if if asking this kind of prompt is really good at getting you to think concretely about what your big project is and can also give you a model for thinking about what you want to accomplish on any given day of your work. The process you just went through where you shared it with someone else is incredibly important. I'm sure your committee members will give you prompt thorough feedback that will help you complete what you need to complete but sometimes maybe on a wednesday in november at 3 p.m you're stuck and you don't know what to do rachel you may know that rhonda has your back and you can send her an email or a text or say hey can we talk for 15 i've got a block can you hear, hear me talk this thing out for five minutes? And Rhonda can give you encouragement and say, I followed you in A and B, but I didn't hear C. There is an awesome resource sitting right next to you and in the room next door. Each of you can be a support and a sounding board for the others, that is an incredible, incredible resource. The like simply talking it out. So my younger brother also has a PhD in uh, Renaissance Lit, and when I want to give myself a litmus test for where I'm at with a project that I'm working on, he's the first person I call. And I know if I can't say it out loud to him, then I'm probably wasting my time sitting, staring at a computer. And then I need to go back and do some more work to get it where I could easily talk about it with him. That's when I'm ready to write. And to sit there in front of the computer and demand from myself that I write 200 words when I don't know what I want to say yet is just self-defeating. To have another person who can ask me questions, who can say that makes sense, go with that. That's super helpful. So do not ignore the resource that's sitting right next to you. An actual living, breathing person who can emotionally sympathize with where you're coming from because they're doing the same kind of work and can cognitively understand the kind of work you're doing as well. All of you have people in your life who will know you bitten off a huge task, not everybody will be able to have a coherent conversation with you about the kind of research you're doing. So to have somebody who you like can do both those things, that's an amazing, amazing thing. Do not take it for granted. All right.
next thing here. We're thinking about the purpose of writing in general. And what I, what I generally tell my students is there's two general purposes for the kind of writing they do in a college classroom. One is to inform, and the other is to persuade. Hopefully you do both and you can see that this sort of mirrors the prompt I gave you. In some way, you were informing yourself because you want to find out, right? But when you start to think about a reader, you start to contemplate, how can I make an argument to that? You're not simply writing a 150-page encyclopedia article. In some sense, you are making an argument that at the end of your argument, you should have somebody who can say, yes, I agree now because of the case you've made, or I would need more evidence here, et cetera, right? Not just inform, but persuade. All right, so here's the thing I want you to think about. Examples. When my wife and I were writing our dissertation, this is something like, how, is there anyone in here other than Dr. East, Dr. Schellsberger, and perhaps uh, Dr. K? who has written a dissertation before. Okay, so you're walking into something new that you haven't done before, but presumably you're here. You have all written an end of the semester paper sometime, okay? Papers that have asked you to inform and persuade your professors of particular things. When my wife and I were writing our dissertation at the our dissertations at the University of South Carolina, eventually what we told ourselves was, well, we've never written 150 pages, but we've written six end of semester papers, and really that's what this thing is. And so when I sat down to write, I knew, and in fact, when you look at my dissertation, there was one chapter in there that was original that none of it had been written until I sat down to write the dissertation. At least part of the other five chapters all came from work I had done in previous courses that I was able to tie together to make my new project. It is super helpful for you to have in your mind places or things you've done, things you've written, that can give you a sense you can do the work you've set before yourself for this project. That's you, your own experience. Now let's talk about other people's work. One of the most difficult things it is uh, about teaching freshmen, sophomores, how to write about, say, literature, is that they may walk into my class wanting to write a poem or a novel, maybe even if they're super weird short stories. Not a, not a lot of people walk around saying, hey, I want to write short stories, the great American short story. It's all like, it's going to be 500 pages or it's going to be six lines of poetry. But nobody ever walks into class saying, you know what? I really love that five-page essay on To Kill a Mockingbird, and I want to write something just like it. Nobody ever says that. Now, this is a problem. Because guess what they do in my class? They don't write To Kill a Mockingbird. They write five-page papers about To Kill a Mockingbird. Mm -hmm. Which all things being equal is way, way far. So, here's how this applies to you. Many of you in here probably have never read page one to page 150 of someone else's dissertation. Much less having your mind, oh, I want to write F. Scott Fitzgerald's great dissertation from 1922. So you are asking yourself <laughs> to write something that you yourself wouldn't want to read. <laughs> that is bad <laughs> emotional mojo when you sit down. Hey, let me write this thing that I wouldn't want to read of somebody else's. So what I'm asking you to do here, you know, to go back to the quotation, not just glorify God, but enjoy him forever. What a cool thing it would be at the end of this process. And I would, I would mark this. I would look for this. Look for people who write the kind of research you're doing 
that you actually like to read. Just to give yourself the headspace of knowing people can do this kind of work and not have it be boring as drying paint. I want you to look for models. And if in your coursework up to this point you already know people who do that kind of work, say there's somebody who talks about your topic in the form of a TED Talk, that person in your field who is popular enough that they have started to bridge the gap between an academic audience and a popular audience, latch on to that person. Because it will give you the possibility of writing something that is not simply hoop jumping, hurdle clearing, but something that's compelling in and of itself. I want you to take the next couple minutes here to write down examples of your own work or things you've read that can serve as models for you for this dual process of informing or persuading. Maybe you can tell yourself, hey, I know there was an email I wrote to my school administrator about a particular policy that I either did not like or that I thought the school should adopt and something happened, that is a worthwhile place for you to go to, to think about a piece of writing you've done that's done work in the world. So two minutes here to think of examples of things you've written and or read that fit those goals of informing and persuading. Go to it. By the way, if you can't think of anything or examples of other people's work, this is why your committee members, your advisors in the School of Education are such amazing resources because if they probably read more widely than you have. They can probably give you names of people who write compellingly about their research. Even if that research is not exactly on your topic, it can be worthwhile to see what good, well-written research looks like. Let's think about what we've done so far. We've thought about starting with gratitude as a way of sort of clearing our minds of the stuff before we sat down to work. Clearing our minds of the stuff we have to get to after we do our work. Starting, do you notice there's a 2005 set of research that says your brain works 31% more effectively when it's positive versus negative, neutral, or stress like sort of like documented research proof now that starting with gratitude as a place for you to start your work actually is putting your brain in a better place too. You've given yourself the short writing prompt about what you want to accomplish. You're thinking about examples here. It's helpful for you to go back to those. Now flip over your sheet. We're going to think about the process of working 
Now, the reason we've taken time to set this up is because it's really easy to get lost in all the different ways we work. If we don't have a clear purpose in our head, this is why we're doing it, or this is what I want to accomplish, then some of this how stuff can get lost. So here's what I want you to think about in terms of how you do your work. What? I was super impressed with the previous group. I asked them this, and I'm going to ask you too, to share with the class at least one non-negotiable factor of you doing good work. Location. So we got people who work on their king size bed, people who can't work in coffee shops because they need a printer near them, people who have to work in an office at the office, not at home. Like no good work is getting done at home. <laughs> Time of day. People who are, everybody's tucked in, now it's time to do my work. People who are up before the crack of dawn, everybody's still in bed, time to do my work. Duration of work. How long can you do the work? Now, this can vary. If you're reading hardcore, not just skimming, looking for quotations, but hardcore going over stuff, God help the person who tries to do that more than two hours at a stretch. It can get hard. So how long can you do this kind of work you're sitting down to do? Ratio of input to output. We have a student sitting right here, Tiffany, who said, I need to work long enough to feel like I accomplished something. So for that kind of person, saying I'm going to work for two hours or 30 minutes is not an accurate goal. For that kind of person, saying I read 450 pages, like that's a ridiculous number, I just pulled it out of my head. <laughs> like saying I read two chapters in the book that I need research from or saying I'm gonna write for however long it takes 500 words, so what is that ratio for you? Do you think more of input or output? Tech availability. Do you need music? Do you need the internet? Do you need the ability to turn off the internet? Do you need a printer? Are you a hard copy person? <coughs> Can you get access to what you need to get access to in a hard copy where you're at? And then writing process. So this is asking about, are you a write by hand first and then transcribe? Are you a person who talks it out and then transfers it over somewhere else? Do you open up separate documents? Do you need Google Docs to do what you're doing or do you have Microsoft Word? Do you need a particular kind of computer to do what you're doing? Here's what I, so I ask you two questions here and I'm gonna, be, gonna give you Five minutes to think about this. What contextual factors contribute to your most productive research and writing? If you had your druthers could snap your fingers, make it perfect, what would your ideal work situation be like to get done your research and writing? And then number two, because you can't simply snap your fingers and make that happen. Given your current circumstances, how are you willing to experiment with contextual factors to get your work done? That is, what is the stuff that is non-negotiable? Like, we had a couple of people in the other room, can I deal with messy spaces? So, nothing in bedrooms. One place, we had somebody else who said, I need to be able to sit at least three different places. I need mobility as I'm thinking. Guess what? Coffee shop, not gonna, that's a, not gonna work. You can't like 30 minutes later go up and sit. I mean, I guess maybe, yeah, it just looks awkward, I guess. Um, but this particular person was like, I need a bed, I could sit down, floor, chair. All right? Time of day. Is that a non negotiable? If that's the case, then what are the elements of the how? that are negotiable for you to experiment with in order to get this work done. Some of this, you're going to find out time of day may be negotiable, just not for a long time. I could get up 
at four, like I get up at five every morning, but I know this about myself. If I try to get another hour, 4 a.m., so I have two hours of writing time after I do uh, prayer, devotion, I can do it for about a month before I will inevitably get sick. It is not something I can sustain long term. So that's what I want you to think about. What's your ideal working situation? What are the details you can experiment with in order to get your work done? Go to it. And remember, it can change depending on the purpose for your work. So you may have one set of answers for reading, another set of answers for writing. Part of the purpose of this question is just to get you to be more self-conscious of how and when you do your best work. Two more minutes. Thirty seconds. I'm going to ask you to do as we go around the room. I'm going to ask you to share one non-negotiable. Now, part of me is like this is like asking Stephen King what kind of pencil he uses when he writes, and he tells you I use a big number two pencil. You picking up a big number two pencil is not going to turn you into Stephen King. But if you hear what helps other people, it will a Resonate with you when you hear something. Oh, yeah, totally. 
that's something maybe I don't do, but that sounds like it would work for me or flee, get the hither, right? Like, you know, definitely that's not going to be you. So let's start here with Robert. Robert, what's one non-negotiable for you about how you work? Location. I have to be at the office or coffee shop or something. I can't work at home. Okay, good to know. Diva. I have to be seated at a, like a desk or a table and chair, like traditionally, but can't sit on a bed, can't sit on a couch. Mm -hmm. Okay, like good, good to know. Rana. Um, I have to be at home where there is noise and normalcy and not what I feel like is an artificial environment like an office or a coffee shop. Okay, <laughs> all right. Also good to know. Rachel? So mine's location too, but I have two very different places depending on, I guess, really just my mood for the day. Yeah. But if I have to be at home, I need to be totally by myself, quiet. I can go wherever. I can sit on a bed. I can be at a desk. I just need quiet. Yeah. But, and for all of you that are not from here, I'm going to tell you a very secret place that you should travel to before you leave. But in Clemson, there's a coffee shop. It's called All In. Mm -hmm. It is the best environment. I go there all the time and I put my headphones on and sometimes I listen to music, sometimes I listen to the noise around me, but that is like the one location. It's not like a typical coffee shop for me, at least. Um, and I go there a ton to work. So y'all need to get it all done. I got really good food there too. <laughs> yeah, so input and the input output ratio can also be talking about food and drink too. Some of you need caffeine coursing through your veins. In order to do what you need to do, share us. Um, I can work at home or in my office at school with this after hours. Um, okay. I have to lock myself away and I like to have um, some nice soft music playing in the background, a little white noise. Um, but you know, just somewhere I can get comfortable, take my shoes off, put my toes in the carpet. Yeah, so, so this, this, this issue of comfort is, a, is an excellent one. So we had a student from the previous session who said, I can't be somewhere where I know I'll get comfortable because as soon as I do that, my mind will wander. So knowing that comfort is a necessity for you to do the work or is in fact an inhibitor, self-awareness here. Tracy. Um, I have to have silence to read, but I don't have to have silence to write. Excellent. Good distinction. And I have to have snacks. Okay. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> Jackie. I pick location. I go in my office. There's just my space. But yep. nobody else is allowed to go. Mm -hmm. And I have a desk. I have to have a desk. Or I sit in my recliner. And that's where I can get everything done. It has to be peace and quiet. Okay. Good to know. Tanya. Okay. <laughs> yes. Yes, it is. April. Um, I think mine's location. Like I'm known to stay at school until eight, eight thirty every day because if I'm at home, even if people will leave me alone, I'm like, I should just be laundry or cooking. So if I just stay in my classroom, it's clean, it's organized, I have I have everything I need. So I can read at home if I have to, but I can never write at home. Okay, and that's an excellent distinction too. Mary Beth. Um, talking about writing, if I'm at home, I, I can write at home, but my husband and I cannot be in the same room. I'm going to have to be in a rolling chair so I can move that room. Okay. <laughs> Good to know. Lynette. Um, I have to be at home for a while. Okay. Okay. Erica. So I, I guess I kind of have like two non-negotiables. So one is location, but so I have like my like my hub, which mm -hmm. is in our home office. It's like two long desks. So basically, everything's like organized there. But then for my creative juices to be flowing. I have to be in my PJs, I have to be comfortable. Mm -hmm. If I have my spot on the couch that my family knows they can't sit there <laughs> as I'm working, like yeah. it's because I can pop my legs up and you know. Yeah. Um, 
And but then, so yeah, like it has to be at home too, so I can go out on my front porch. I love my front porch; that's my favorite space. Be able to like walk out, take some yeah. breaths, water my ferns, you know, like right. clear my head for a minute, and I have to have snacks. Um, so like I just have to be at home, you know, to be able to do that. And then the other non-negotiable for me is the time of day, and that is any time my children are not going to bug me. So that would be students or personal children. Okay. <laughs> Can't do any work with yeah. children. All right. Yeah. <laughs> so my wife, my wife and I just moved to a new house we built, and I was thinking about this. It's a blank slate, really. None of those spaces have been marked by certain kinds of activities. And I can already, like I already know, nothing's going to happen when I sit on the couch. Then <laughs> minutes later, I'm asleep or something like that. And my wife is already making sacred the kitchen island that is gigantic and just seems to call out for a laptop or something there. And she's like, no, nope, no clutter on there, which means all that stuff has to go to the front room, which means that... If I do that, I basically have time. Where it's like I'm telling the rest of the family goodbye. <laughs> I'm going to the front to do work now, which I don't want to do when they're up, right? So it means that I've got either in the morning when they're not up yet, or at night after they've gone to bed to do that kind of work. And I just set that aside. Jolene. Um, for me, it, it really doesn't matter where, as long as it's silent, somewhere, um, door closed, no interruptions, and then what I do is I just start typing, and then whatever comes to mind, and then I go back later and make it make sense. Okay. Good. So there, you have to have a gap of time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, well, that's, that's good to know, too. Tammy. Um, I am one of those weird morning people, so um, I like to um, just get up and have my coffee and get to it. Yes. Um, the bad thing though is that I can't have three and four hours in the morning before work. Right. Um, I get in a good two hours, and then I'm struggling after work to get the other couple hours in. Okay. Um, I always sit in my den at my table. My husband knows that's my spot. Um, I have a, a coffee table that pulls up, and that's my space. Yeah. So. <laughs> Margaret. Um, Non-negotiable for me is uh, quiet, no interruptions, no phone, no sound. Because I'm okay. very easily um, distracted. And if I hear something, it's all over. So it has to be okay. quiet. Um, my space varies either during the week it's at work and it's after work um and at home on the weekends i'm an afternoon so i think because i do it at work afternoon and after work that the afternoon is just better for me yeah so i do like one to four and then i have to take frequent breaks yeah. in between and uh, and then i come back to it later on that evening but Afternoon, quiet. Okay. No options. Good. <laughs> Tiffany. Um, I work better with noise, except yeah. for when I'm reading. But when I read, I get sleepy. So, <laughs> um, but I created a space and I made it in my office and the playroom, so my daughter can watch all her shows and play and. I work better with her, okay. and then of course I take breaks to check on her, and it just helps my thought process just continue because my life is never dull, and I don't have quiet time. I don't know what that is. Okay. <laughs> I do have a discord, but the noise <laughs> yeah. um, helps me focus. I guess. Yeah. I work better with people around. I got confidence in them. <laughs> so, and this this is an oversight on my part. So, if we look. And all, all of these things I've listed, I have not listed people. Like, you are a person, you're not a robot. You, hopefully, not only the people in this room, your advisors, your committee members, but you have people in your life who want you to succeed. At some point, you will talk to them about this process, and it will be necessary for you 
not to simply complete it in a vacuum, but to complete it while maintaining the relationships you have with the people who are near and dear to you. So that is something worth considering. All right, the what here is pretty easy. I'm just giving you some categories to think about the purpose for any given work session you have. The first three here are the big ones that you will tackle on the front end of your project. You could say, today I'm gonna to work on my main argument or position. Today I'm gonna to work on my organization, my plan of attack, or today I'm going to accumulate evidence. That may be a really good way for you to think about front end tasks for a day's worth of work. Everything I do today is about my thesis. Everything I do today is about organizing what I already have, or it's about accumulating more evidence. The final two here, strong continuity of argument and persuasive closing appeal are I dotting and T crossing and typically come after you already have material to work with. All right, we're not, we're not actually going to do this. I'm going to give you a, re a reflective prompt instead. But the reason I put this on your sheet to try it again is to give you this prompt. At the end of your session, have some kind of loop closing exercise that gives you a sense of what you've accomplished that day. So you have something to hold on to. For me today, it was easy to say, hey, let's try to fill out that prompt we did at the beginning of our session again and see whether you are better able after your conversations with one another to complete it with a better articulated purpose, a more specific thing you wanted to find out or a real purpose for what you wanted your reader to understand. Give yourself a way to assess if you've gotten done the thing you sat down to do. It's easy to turn pages in a book and at the end say, well, I turned 150 pages today. But if you don't sit down and write the major takeaway, a week, two weeks, a month, much less a month later. All that input doesn't mean anything if you don't have a concrete way of assessing whether in the moment I understood what I was actually reading. All right? So let's end here with a reflection for yourself. What was the most important concept you got from today's session? Or two, what is one question you have after the session in your of course, free to email me that. I'll give you a minute to fill that out on your sheet test for yourself, and I'm sure it's something every single one of your instructors will be asking you to do. What's the most important thing you got out of today in our time together? Or what is one question you have? And if you have a question, you can certainly email me about it. A minute there to reflect. Staying with me, I want to give you a benediction. Thank you so much for your participation today. I hope you walked away with something on the street that can help you. May the God of peace grant you a keen understanding, a retentive memory, the ability to grasp things correctly and fundamentally. May he also grant you the ability to explain yourself and the charm and thoroughness necessary to complete this project well. In the name of Jesus, amen. All right, have a good rest of your day.